Welcome to the flipped lesson on the Elizabethan worldview. As with all my flipped lessons, this is not going to take the place of your own reading and research, but is merely a place for you to begin thinking and researching. This is the standard copyright notice at the beginning of all my flipped lessons. Queen Elizabeth was Queen of England from 1533 to 1603. We call this period the Elizabethan period, and it was one of great religious, cultural and political change. She was the daughter of King Henry VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn. I'm sure you know the story of Henry VIII's six wives and have heard the rhyme, Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. But how could Henry have divorced so many wives if he was a Catholic? Well, it was he who created the Church of England after several disagreements with the Pope. Henry became head of the Church of England, just as Queen Elizabeth II is the head of the Church of England today, and this allowed him to divorce and remarry. He did, however, retain many Catholic practices and customs. Under Henry's son, King Edward VI, more Protestant-influenced forms of worship were adopted. However, when Queen Mary I's reign began, she, being a staunch Catholic, sought to return England to Catholicism. During this period, Protestants were persecuted, tortured and killed for their beliefs, which is how she has earned the nickname Bloody Mary. Queen Mary died childless, so the crown passed to her half-sister Elizabeth I, who was a Protestant, and the Church of England was restored. She was more tolerant than her sister had been, and generally turned a blind eye to Catholics who worshipped in secret. Elizabeth I was eventually succeeded by King James I, who ordered the Bible to be translated into English, thereby making it easily accessible by the public. This is the official King James Bible we still use today. Shakespeare wrote his plays and poetry during the reigns of these two monarchs, and we see this religious strife and feud reflected in his plays, such as the long-standing feud between the Montagues and the Capulets, which also resulted in many innocent deaths. Perhaps, in fact, the resolution of Romeo and Juliet sent a message which goes beyond love. So, now that we have been briefly introduced to some of the political and religious turmoil, Let's consider what was happening culturally in the world of art, architecture, literature and philosophy. After all, what is the study of literature without the context of the period we are studying? And the cultural and artistic context of this period is the Renaissance. I will talk a little bit about the Renaissance now, but it is up to you to do your own research and find out the new ways of seeing the world and humanity. We will look at some of these very briefly. The word Renaissance, as I am sure you are aware, means rebirth. This was the period in Europe between the medieval or Middle Ages and the modern period in history, and saw the revival of the classical civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome, including the art, architecture, philosophy and literature. In Raphael's famous painting, The School of Athens, for example, we see nearly every great Greek philosopher idealised and romanticised. In the centre, we can see Plato walking with his student Aristotle, Plato's on the left. This painting is arguably considered as the perfect embodiment of the classical spirit of the Renaissance. During this time, a movement known as humanism had a great influence on individuals and their philosophy of life. Humanists had great faith in man's ability to shape his own future. They tended to shift the emphasis from life after death to life on earth. The term humanism refers to thoughts and actions which are directed at improving society. A humanist was understood not merely as someone in possession of a great love for humanity, but rather as one who had mastered the humane arts in order to attain a superior level of knowledge, wit, written and spoken eloquence and deeper understanding of the world and history. Indeed, Shakespeare himself can be understood as the ultimate product of Renaissance humanism, he was an artist with a deep understanding of humanity and an uncanny ability for self-expression who openly practised and celebrated the ideals of intellectual freedom. Many of his plays reveal humanist philosophy, such as the character of Cassius and Julius Caesar who says to Brutus, The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. 
This suggests that a human being is responsible for his or her own decisions and that we have the power to create our own destiny. This was in direct contrast to the old deterministic fatalistic view of the world which taught that we are all subject to fate and everything is controlled and determined by God. Consider the great wheel of fortune where fate or fortune was the main controlling force in life. Just as a part of a wheel moves from a low to a high position or from high to low, so does a man's life. So can you see the tension between these two concepts, humanistic and deterministic, in Romeo and Juliet? On the one hand, fate certainly has a hand in the fate of the star-crossed lovers. Yet we see both Romeo and Juliet making decisions and saying things which show they are directly responsible for what happens to them. Look at Macbeth and the Weird Sisters. Even though they prophesy that he will become king, and even though Lady Macbeth manipulates him, it is ultimately Macbeth who makes the fatal decision to do the deed. We find this fate versus free will debate being explored several times in Shakespeare's plays. Similarly, Shakespeare's plays reflect the belief of the divine right of kings and queens to rule. The monarch was God's representative on earth, and if he or she was murdered, the whole order of the universe would be affected. We see this most clearly in Macbeth, but also in other plays such as Julius Caesar, where even though he is not king, Caesar's death affects the natural and social worlds. So let's look at this order of the universe, or the great chain of being. The universe is ruled by God. In heaven, God rules over archangels and angels. On earth, there is order everywhere based on hierarchical system. Everything in society has its place with fixed classes from highest to lowest. There is even a fixed order for plants, animals and minerals. The key thing is order. Anytime someone attempts to break the great chain of being, there is universal disorder. We'll see this in Macbeth. When the chain of being is broken, we can immediately tell because of the unnaturally wild weather and animals. It's like a domino effect. It is only when the chain of being is restored that the universe goes back to normal. So let's have a look at this great chain of being. At the top, we have God, followed by the archangels, angels and demons. Then we have man, which can be further broken down into different classes and professions, followed by women. Notice the patriarchal and religious ideologies coming through. After human beings, we have the animal world, of which the lion is the highest. This is followed by plants and minerals, of which gold is the best. As we can see, everything has an order, and this order is not to be disturbed. The Elizabethan construction of the universe, also known as the Ptolemaic universe, was still popular in the Elizabethan age. This system saw the Earth at the centre of the universe and the Sun, Moon and planets orbited Earth. Even though the Copernican model with the Sun at the centre was around, this old view persisted. This can also be linked to the great chain of being, as there is an order and a correct place for everyone and everything. Note the Earth in the centre and the perfect orbits around it. This Ptolemaic view of the universe suggests that God is the ultimate creator and has created this perfect order which should not be interfered with. Everything has its place and its path, whether love or kingship. Several people were punished by the Vatican for their belief in the Copernican model, such as Galileo. Finally, we come to the four humours. The four bodily humours were part of Shakespearean cosmology, inherited from the ancient Greek philosophers Aristotle, Hippocrates and Galen. In the human body, the interaction of the four humours explained differences of age, gender, emotions and disposition. The influence of the humours changed with the seasons and times of day and with the human lifespan. For example, heat stimulated action, cold depressed it. The young warrior's collar gave him courage, but phlegm produced cowards. Youth was hot and moist, age cold and dry. Men as a sex were hotter and drier than women. These four humours were found in the body and were the yellow bile, black bile, phlegm and blood. We still use these associations today. For example, someone who is always happy and cheerful is sanguine, which is associated with air. 
Someone who is easily angered is choleric, which is associated with fire. People who are often sad are melancholic, associated with the earth. And phlegmatic people, associated with water, are cool, calm and collected. We all have various combinations of these, and the best person is he or she who has these in perfect balance, such as Brutus in Julius Caesar. A person who has more or less of one is out of harmony and is unwell either physically, mentally or emotionally. You have now listened to the flipped lesson on the Elizabethan worldview. This provides much of the context for the study of any of Shakespeare's plays. Remember that while the plays themselves are set in different times and places, they always reflect the context they were created in. It is up to you to read and research everything you have learned today and to apply them to the text you are studying. If you rely only on what I have said today, you will not be adequately informed. You have been warned.